Okay, so good afternoon, everyone, and thank you all for coming to this yet another fantastic Tech Thursday sessions. Uh, now we're getting in the flow of it. This is the third in a row. Uh, we did one uh, in end of February, one first week of the March, uh, March, and then this is the third one. Um, as you probably aware that we are running uh, a working party, we have launched we've launched a working party on inclusive assessment and sort of driving change to make assessments more just uh, inclusion inclusive and and so on so if you would like to join uh, the group in that capacity we would uh, share a link later on so please do feel free to join us uh, in making that happen in whichever institutions you are representing in whichever your practices okay so we make a start um i'm here today with the, with my uh, colleague from portsmouth university in the school of energy and electronic engineering uh, dr jabriel uh Golinizad, and uh, him and i are going to talk to you about directed study chat gpt led independent study and an exam revision and um and, and our findings from some some recent uh, as well as some very long-standing uh, interventions so we'll highlight the problem statement, show some case studies on directed studies, including Examopedia, which is an exam revision service, and civic Examopedia style documents in, in classrooms being used to, to run directed study events. Um, also talk about some during and post pandemic uh, disruptors like the open book exam to assessment and chat GPT also a big disruptor at the minute. Uh, and later on, we'll, we'll have some time for Q&A. Um, and I will highlight a potential opportunity for us to, to be taking part in a collaboration if anybody is interested uh, in that front. Okay, and uh, what I'll do is I'll go through the first few slides and then I'll pass over the control to, to Jeb for sharing his example. And then Jeb will do the same back to me for, for the rest of the presentation. And feel free to use the chat to put any questions. We may be able to um, look at those and, and come back to you. Right, so for for uh, this particular project, we are looking at exams and, and, and really end of module exams that we're talking about here, they're often you know, used as assessment of re learning rather than assessment for learning. And there's some research to, to suggest that. Um, and that's because they tend to take place after all the instruction has, has happened. And basically uh, because of which they become separated from, from the educational process, like when you're teaching and, and they have a opportunity to ask you questions. And so exams kind of stuck at the end of a module, that's problematic, what we are saying. Um, almost exclusive purpose of such assessments tend to be to test what the student already knows, you know, their sufficient knowledge and not kind of engage them in, in, in more learning if, if it was possible. So that's the, the predicament of, of an end of module exam. That's the difficulty. And we often find students saying, what is important for the exam, sir, or teacher, or whatever they refer you as, uh, what will come in the exam, and sort of showing their anxiousness, their anxiety about this format of ex assessment, a closed book exam, maybe even, you know, so that's what used to happen before, in most cases, before the pandemic hit us. And the feedback they get is, yes, it's useful for reflecting on it, but maybe not as useful for other modules and, you know, or, or a future exam. So it's a thing that happens in a, you know, on a retrospective basis. And rather than, you know, helping somebody to become better for, for that particular module that time. So, yeah, not assessment for learning, it's assessment of learning, that kind of scenario. A systematic review uh, done recently on, well, not so recent, but still relevant on exam as an assessment uh, suggests that traditional exams are linked to anxiety, which we have kind of hinted uh, before, uh, but also uh, anxiety is really linked to lowering exam performance. And another um, point that this paper highlighted was that uh, exam anxiety, you know, if you were, if you worried about who are going to be my worried students, you know, if you if you were to uh, put a finger on on who which of the students have the lowest uh, self esteem in the class, uh, they were the, they will probably be the ones. And this tends to be the middle of the class, maybe towards those who are really, um, you know, 
uh, somewhere in the middle you know, from 30 to, to 60, 65, sort of that touch sort of area. They'll be worried about the exam the most. The ones who are going to excel in exams, they're going to they're going to excel and they're not worried. The ones who are going to fail and that they know that they're going to fail, perhaps also not so much worried. But yes, they will be worried um, to, to an extent, but not as much as the ones in the middle are, tends to be more, more worried. That's the, the research paper was suggesting. Um, and then self-efficacy is, is another sort of related term, which is also positively linked with, with performance. So if you're more feeling confident about a subject and, and uh, you got likely to do well. Um, right. So and another systematic review looked at the comparison between open and closed book exam. And it said that the latter, which is the closed book exam, may promote superficial learning with things like requiring a lot of memorization and, and stuff. Um, it is also therefore more stressful and a less preferred mode of assessment by many students. And it's uh, no doubt less inclusive because if you're relying on memory, then of course some people have learning difficulties which prevent them to be very good with you know lots of memorization. An open book, on the other hand, as this research suggests, uh, also that they can be more engaging and they require a different set of questions. A higher order thinking skills uh, are being tested in in those type of exams. So. That's the, the problem statement, um, that there is there is this issue of the or divide between assessment for learning and, and off learning. Um, here are some other sort of quotations from different papers about what is assessment for learning then. Um, the benefits are that, uh, you, you know, a tutor is able to point out problems in a student's work and they can then benefit and have follow up discussions if necessary, as in the first case. The second one suggesting that feedback is information about a gap between an actual level and a reference level. Uh, so if you're if you're an engineer, you 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 have a feedback control system. If you um, provide some feedback from the output to the input, you you could probably tune the system to to reduce that gap somehow. So this is again a real time sort of system where the feedback is. And, and if you apply that knowledge to to exams, obviously not possible because you can't have feedback coming in in the process of the examination. So there's that difficulty for doing AFL in exam. Um, seeking and interpreting evidence uh, for use by learners and their teachers to decide where the, where the learners are in their learning journey and where they need to go and how best to get there. Again, it's not possible inside examination situation, but that's what assessment for learning is about. Likewise, um, assessment for learning also has benefits for the teacher because you then get to know what the states of mind the student are and you can improve your learning and teaching process as you go along with them. You are on the journey with them. So that's the benefit of AFL. But whereas the uh, um, assessment of learning, it's kind of the, the word itself, exam, which can perpetuate anxiety and hinders the transition for students to become uh, independent learners. Um, so for us, uh, uh, we, we were interested in, in answering these um, two questions. How can directed study initiatives help with this gap between AFL and AOL? And how to then prepare students to become independent? If these are the, the problems and this other background, these are my questions we are interested in. Before the pandemic hit us, we used to have mostly closed book, closed book exams in our in our uh, courses and uh, mostly used as assessment of learning, as we've just been talking about. Um, revision tended to be um, quite an individual thing. Students I'm talking about here, they would be sitting down on their own revising, um, probably isolating. And very few people will form groups and study in groups, but majority of the class kind of doing it individually. Uh, but we also noted that uh, we had a diverse uh, intake of students, people coming who are into the first year with having no exam background, especially those with BTEC qualifications and things like that. So we felt that there is a need to do some kind of training in, in, in exams um, for students and make it collaborative to, to overcome these isolating sort of stressful experiences that the student have been telling us. So we created this. I created this uh, um, service called Examopedia, which is basically uh, we will show you how it works in a minute. 
uh, and Jim and I have some some case studies to to share with you today. But it is essentially a collaborative exam revision uh, service, uh, but uh, which which gives the opportunity to to do this assessment for learning business that that we uh, can't achieve with the exam otherwise. And it has been used in, since 2007 in my school uh, and has benefited many students, uh, as you will see some some uh, testimonies and some data later on. Um, and it reaches each time it reaches more or at least the same number of people who are in the class uh, in, in the let's say the revision session that tends to happen towards the end of the, the block again. Um, and moreover, uh, in the last few years, it has triggered new innovations uh, based on so the idea being used by many people. And as it happens, when people take an idea, they obviously um, innovate around it as well further. So that's been happening in my school. And uh, it, it is it is after you've used Examopedia for two to three years, then you would have learned enough from your from your students and the students obviously would have learned enough from you as well. But you 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 would end up doing things slightly differently in, in your class. Hence, there's a potential to improve teaching and learning in using Examopedia. And um, the students will, will tell you that they, they, they whatever you're doing right at the end, perhaps we should now start doing it much earlier. So we've done, we've listened to them and we have brought the Examopedia activity into Examopedia style documents throughout the, the teaching weeks. And that has helped in uh, making the classrooms more active and even outside the classrooms more active um, through asynchronous sort of uh, uh, interaction between student and, and, and staff. What is Examopedia? I'll just go through uh, you know, these points with you. So basically, it's a Google document. You could use a wiki for it. Uh, and it has been structured in a, in a specific way. I will show you an example. But what happens is you, you, the, the, the document has some questions on it. And the questions have some spaces below, which the students can fill with their own researched answers to, to, to whatever type, type of question you put in there. Um, and as students put their answers in, obviously, they could be diverse answers, they could be similar answers, and undoubtedly, there will be somewhere where the answers are very different, and there are some common mistakes in them, and so on. And you, you then get a chance to, to come back and give feedback to the students and make that visible to the whole class so it's shared. And you never want to give the final answer until perhaps the, the answers have been produced by the students and they're correct. And you say, yes, finally, did that, that you've come to that right place. Um, you've understood it. So really trying to make this as an opportunity for learning and uh, rather than you know live with the fact that uh, exams are assessment of learning and, and there's no, um, yeah, there's little to, to do over uh, overcome that. And if you see some questions that are unanswered, obviously that's an opportunity for you to do some more teaching either this year, um, if you want to do, if you have time or for the next. And you can choose what type of questions you want to put. You want you can put past exam questions there, or you could put very small, short answer questions so to so that student can engage with uh, little chunks of, of learning from time to time. Now at this point, I'd like to pass the control back to my uh, colleague Jeb who is waiting, uh, I guess, uh, to, for me to do so. Yeah, Jeb, if you can share your screen. Thank and you, Manish. I'm just sure. trying to share my screen. Can you see my screen? It's loading, it says. Yes, I can see it. Okay, so let me this was presented by yourself. Um, so hello everyone. <clears throat> My name is Jeb. Uh, I am a senior lecturer uh, at the School of Energy and Electronic Engineering um, at the University of Portsmouth. I am also a course leader for two MSc courses uh, in the school. Um, so I am here to uh, provide some information, some examples of my implementation of Examopedia. Um, I am not um, the one who has uh, given the original idea. It is coming from Manish, but I have just tried to implement it on a regular basis in all my modules. I have used it in uh, since 2018 uh, in four different modules. Um, 
and during this time um, out of 264 students in the, in the, in the class uh, 208 students has reached and used this document uh, which is about uh, nearly 80 percent of the students now in terms of the modules that i'm teaching the class sizes are typically between um, 20 to, to 40 students except one module which has um, a little bit um, which is larger cohort um, 80 90 students um, so i have been implementing um, this examopedia which is perhaps one of the good um, methods of directed study but it's mainly for exam revision um, and as Manny said we are trying to use it um, even before getting to that point where the exams uh, take place so uh, during the teaching uh, but the examples that i'm showing today are mainly for exam revision a few weeks before the exam um, again uh, Manish already explained how the examopedia is uh, set up but uh, just to repeat um, the instructor provides um, prepare some questions um, which is typical questions similar to exam uh, exam questions uh, and um, put it in a tabulated form um, there would be different rows uh, under each question uh, which is used for the students to contribute and write their answers then this document is shared with the students the students are invited to contribute we also put a link in our virtual learning environment so they can click on it but you know with the students um, it is always good to repeat um, this invitation to you know to, to um, again remind them during your lectures sending emails etc so it's um, so so all the students are aware of it and they can come and contribute to it now at the top of the document we add some notes um, and the most important point is that we should emphasize to the students that they don't rely uh, on this um, piece of resource only. So they, uh, for the exam, they should use all the material that we have taught during the term. Um, and this one should not be the only source of uh, revi uh, revising the exam, uh, the, the revision for the exam. Um, in fact, I, I, I have a kind of disclaimer which I use even in my uh, lecture, revision lectures, uh, where I say to the students that these questions that I'm solving today um, don't think that the exam questions are going to be exactly the same or even similar to these questions. There, there may or may not be similar, um, and they will have to eventually um, read all the document, all the, all the material that has been provided available to the students. Um, so that's one point that needs that needs to be emphasized. Um, as you can see in red, we have uh, put some dates and times, which are uh, checkpoints, and that's when um, we go and uh, check the student contributions. Uh, we'll be able because this is these questions are set up in a Google Doc, which is online. So the, the, it has a good feature that you can comment and give feedback to the students. Um, you can give your comments, you can provide feedback. Uh, now, having so many dates and times doesn't mean that you will have more work to do because um, you know that students um, usually leave the revision, let's say majority of the students, not all of them, uh, leave the revision for the last few days. So for the few, first few uh, occasions, uh, the dates and times that you, that you, you go and check and you see uh, no one has contributed and perhaps you use that use it as a prompt to remind the students again to uh, to come and contribute to the uh, document but uh, the document become uh, let's say uh, you become busy and document become busy um, near the, the exam perhaps uh, one or two weeks before the exam um, I usually put the exam date on this document as well uh, I think it's a good practice to um, leave it there because some students um, forget to check their timetable for the exam and get confused by the different dates. So it is always good that they see it here. They know when exactly their exam is going to take place. Um, it is also important to have a cutoff date because um, if you keep doing this until the last minute before the exam, uh, first of all, some students will not be able to check it before the exam. And also uh, they will focus too much on this one piece of resource for the revision. Um, so one or two days before the exam, you will give a cutoff date after which you will not be checking the document 
or at least you will not be providing any uh, feedback to the students' answers. So in terms of uh, the examples of modules that I have used, uh, I have used Examopedia. Uh, so I have only inserted module codes here. M21983 is, um, the title is actually Numerical and Computational Methods. Um, as engineers, you know, we have lots of um, modules with uh, design questions, computations, calculations. Um, and as a matter of fact, I'm also a little bit nerd of mathematics, so I like calculation-based questions. So you would see from my snapshots also that most of majority of our questions are calculation-based, but it is possible to use, um, um, of course, theoretical questions in the same way um, or text-based uh, questions. And one thing that we have been recently practicing is to try and integrate ChatGPT with Examopedia, uh, because ChatGPT is good for perhaps um, for text-based text -based, um, interventions uh, rather than calculations, because I have seen for uh, calculations it is uh, a little bit um, having problems and errors, but, um, but yes. Um, so in this module, um, in one iteration that I have had, about 63% of the students used Examopedia. Uh, the last one was 2020 because after that this module, the course was closed and um, the module um, did not run, but I, I have been teaching this module for a few years before it was closed. Um, so 63% of the students use the Examopedia. If we compare these numbers with the revision lectures, I would normally have one revision lecture before the exam. Um, those revision lectures, usually the contribution is high, the, the attendance is high. Um, it is not only because of the exam, students are thinking about the exam and they want uh, to focus on, on exams, but also I uh, normally tell them that they, I will provide some, I would provide some uh, information about the exam, so that encourages them to come to the uh, session where uh, we, we saw some questions uh, similar to uh, typical questions about from the material. Uh, but I mean, comparing it, we can just say that they are comparable. Or sometimes, in some instances, it is higher than these uh, revision attendance in these revision lectures. But I think that's good enough to have comparable numbers using those documents. Um, another module is M30615. This is a module which is sold to all MSc students. And the title of the module is actually Engineering Management, Economics, and Risk Analysis. Um, I have be, been using uh, Examopedia in this module for the last two years, uh, nearly 70% last year and more than 80% 80 this year uh, contributed to the Examopedia. Now, this contribution, by the way, doesn't mean that every each and every student come and write their answers. Um, some students, after you give the comments, you provide the feedback. Some students come and check and uh, learn from those feedback, those, those uh, comments. Uh, they may not need to, to contribute, um, especially if you say the answer is correct and they don't need to uh, write the answer again. Um, but these, this is, in fact, we are talking about numbers of the students. It is not repetition of, um, you know, it would be different students in terms of the numbers. So, so this percentage is for different num uh, students with unique student numbers. Um, so yes, we will have some snapshots of, again, um, this, this module, um, the Examopedia for this module as well. But this is, the, the chart simply shows the contribution from the students in two occasions, in 2002 and 2020, 2022 and 2023. So in uh, revision sessions, uh, we have 57% 50 in 2022 or in the revision lecture. I found the data from our um, our attendance uh, monitoring system, and 80% this year. Now, I always try to find reasons why uh, we have low or high attendance. Um, so that 57% is, um, is probably because last year it was an online revision session. And those online revision sessions are recorded, so they would have had access to, to the recorded uh, session after 
uh, after that that date. So perhaps some of them just prefer to to watch the video so they don't turn up for the revision session. But I'm talking about revision lecture. In terms of examopedia, it was 70% last year. Um, I had another module M24608. The class size was not uh, too big, about 19 students. Um, and 84% of the students, again, uh, tried to use the examopedia. Um, and uh, for the revision session, it was 74% uh, those who attended the revision session uh, before the exam. So some examples, uh, perhaps some lessons that I have learned during this time from these examopedia, the implementation of the examopedia, and some snapshots from the examopedia and my comments. Um, first of all, it helps the students understand how your marking style is and how the, the marking scheme works for each module, for each exam. Uh, because you, in your comments, for example, you will mention that the answer that you have given um, will not get high mark because you are missing this bit of information or that type of information. Um, so they will know what is important to, uh, in that particular question. What, kind of, what should, should they cover uh, when they are answering that, that question? So for example, in this case, I have said that if they don't write their workout in the calculations, it is important for us that they write their workout. They don't just give the final answer. So if they give final answer, if the question has 10 marks, it will only be one or two marks that they can get. So they, they have to show they're working and it is important to emphasize uh, this beforehand. Uh, so they will know that in the exam they should write their their working. Uh, or in this case, I have asked them to write the formula. Well, we don't ask them to memorize the formulas, uh, but uh, when they are solving it, whether they are getting from the material, if it is open book or it is provided in the exam paper, then they need to write it again, write the formula again um, to, to solve the question. Um, so this helps them to, to get an idea of how the marking will work. Um, you can direct students to, to certain uh, material, you can refer them to certain uh, material um, that you have made available to them, whether it is your lecture slides or your tutorials, or sometimes maybe um, a book, um, you read to a certain book to read a certain page uh, to understand the question and, the, and to, uh, to realize what would be the best answer to that, that question. Um, so, for example, in uh, in this case, I have asked the student to refer to the tutorial one for the definitions, or in this case, I have asked them to uh, look at slide six in the relevant lecture. So that, in fact, uh, prompts them to go and look at the material and perhaps look at the whole whole material. They may take the time to look at, you know, review the material, the relevant material, and that would be uh, a revision for at least that part of the lecture. Um, it is also good uh, to um, good practice to identify students with different styles. Um, we have students who give, I'm sure you all um, have had these kind of instances, students who give very short answers, um, sometimes just a matter of one word, or if it's a definition, just very short uh, one, one uh, line definition. Um, it's not necessarily the weak students. Sometimes the good students also, because they want to be concise, they know the answer. They think that if they, they, they sometimes have this perception that the instructor knows that they know the answer. So they, by default, uh, they think that if, if they write a short answer, the instructor will assume that they know the answer. But in the exam, we, we, are, we are marking it blindly. So they should write um, what is necessary for the answer. So even this, sometimes smart students also uh, write um, a short answer and they, they are missing one piece of information or keyword um, and not getting the full mark for the question. Uh, some students, on the other hand, write lengthy answers, lots of text. It is possible that in that long text you find the correct answer or you may just find it um, some nonsense without um, referring to any part of the answer. Um, but you will know um, when the students come and contribute, you can identify these kind of uh, students and perhaps these kind of answers, and you can perhaps emphasize on 
uh, a few things to help them uh, to, to improve their answer. Um, some of them prefer theoretical questions, some prefer uh, calculation-based questions. Um, and also some of them, uh, you will always find students who have weak mathematical background. So giving some uh, hints um, to them helps, for example, in terms of those students usually write the, um, the mathematical equations incorrectly or in terms of uh, fractions, they don't do it correctly in terms of procedure of uh, whether deriving or solving the equations. Um, or you can see they forget to write the units, they, they forget to write the right decimal points. Um, so it is good to always remind, you know, give some comments and feedback about these things. Um, you can motivate the students to engage more with the examopedia. Um, if you just keep criticizing the answers and just uh, saying that it is incorrect, it is wrong, then students may be discouraged to contribute more. And um, so sometimes you, you have to motivate them by saying, well done for doing this. In fact, as my, sometimes students, I will perhaps, I, I was thinking to refer to it later on uh, about, uh, you know, improving the teaching, but you find students who give kind of answer, which is new answer, not the same answer that you, you are thinking, but it is correct answer. So in that way, you also learn from it. Um, and in that case, of course, you can also, um, so, uh, you know, you, you can say, well done for doing this. And sometimes the students come and um, create some communication with you. Sometimes they engage. I personally wouldn't prefer that because uh, I, I tell them that try not to use, uh, not to put comments in the examopedia document because that may confuse other students. Um, but, you know, sometimes it's, it's you see that, um, there's no harm in leaving those comments um, in the examopedia. So sometimes they come and um, communicate with you and you um, try to get direct them to, to, to do more. Um, and remember to always have, we remember to always have one version of this examopedia as view only. So in case, because this is editable uh, version, students may just remove the questions and so on. So you have a view only one as well. And sometimes these actually discussions continue via email. Some students prefer, for the various reasons, they uh, want to continue the discussion via email. They, they contact you and ask about the same question or other questions or uh, want to learn more. So um, the good thing is that you can also learn from this. Um, uh, you can try to eliminate the source of sources of confusion and misunderstanding and uh, the following year when you are uh, you are doing your teaching you have a better idea of what were uh, what was the perhaps challenging part what was the confusing part uh, so you can improve your teaching based on that um, you can identify the common mistakes that students make and perhaps um, again in your teaching you uh, refer to those common mistakes and uh, try um, to give some ways of mitigating it uh, and eventually identify the areas of strength and weakness um, for the module for the teaching and try to improve um, your teaching later on um, one point that i forgot to mention the students can also add images so they can write it by hand um, and then take a picture and add it because especially if in our case it's calculation based typing might, might not be easy so they can write on paper and scan it and put it up on this document. Um, I think yeah, that's, I just wanted to give some examples of implementing this um, Examopedia, but uh, as I said, there are ways of integrating ChatGPT with this, um, with this tool uh, and also using similar documents for during your teaching rather than just leaving for the revision. Um, so at this point, I, I, I will just give the floor back to Manish. Thank you very much for listening. OK, great. Thank you so much for that, Jeb. That was fantastic. Let me uh, continue from here. I hope you can see my slides. Uh, yeah, I hope, yeah. It's coming up. 
Yes, excellent. So as you could as you could see from Jeb's uh, presentation, the assessment of learning, you know, you can't escape it pretty much from from the exam point of view. But if you see, if you think about this being used two or three weeks before the exam, in that moment, there is a lot of learning that is happening with the student and the staff. And that's where the, the goodness of, of, of this technique uh, sits. And that's what is kind of making, yes, there's an exam at the end of it. That is by fact an assessment of learning. But there is um, this kind of collaborative revision happening before the exam, which makes it a little bit more uh, interactive and less isolating for students, but also uh, makes the focus more towards learning than sort of rote uh, memorizing information and, and things, which tend to happen when students are learning individually and in, uh, preparing for an exam and there's no opportunity for interaction. So I actually set out to ask these questions of students in the last 16 years. Uh, in the first 10 years, I would collect surveys every so often and, you know, for some of my modules, sometimes all of my modules. So I, I, I present to you now what I have been uh, getting back from the students on that. So 80% have agreed to the fact that this helps their exam revision of the 210 who completed the surveys from a probably larger number uh, of sample who actually were in the class. Not everybody completed the survey. Um, top of my head, maybe about 33% or 40, 30 to 35% was probably the, the the completion rate, but here we go. Eighty percent uh, found that it is uh, allowing you access to different views of fellow students, which is by design. Basically, those boxes below the questions are exactly for that reason. Sometimes it is the same view, sometimes it's different, sometimes it's both wrong, sometimes it's both correct, sometimes it's different. Anyway, sixty-eight uh, percent were agreeing to the fact that because of these diverse answers coming up, it helped them. Uh, broaden their understanding of the topics that were on on the document, and 67 said percent said it helped increase the depth of learning. So I was interested both in the the worth and the in the depth of of um, the topics and their understanding. So um, and about 54 uh, percent agreed to when I asked them a question, does it help you reduce your exam anxiety? And only 22 percent said no. And these are I'm thinking the people who were high achievers and and there would be another another 20 who 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 didn't benefit in that same way but look 54 percent have said uh, that they they agree that the exam anxiety has been brought down so that's a um, noticeable number 79 percent said that they will use it again and only about seven percent said that they did not use the examopedia service during the examination the revision period so with those highlights, uh, you know, I have approached my colleagues in my own school and I said, well, uh, if you, would you be interested in doing this uh, as, a, as a pilot in your practice? Maybe some of you are thinking right now, maybe that you want to use it. Maybe you think, no, this is not for me. Either is fine, but this is what happened when I when I um, ran the first pilot. So we, we looked at um, modules across the, the school. Uh, in the foundation year, in the first year, in the second year, and so on. And uh, what we find that look, this is this is what's happening. Each module is represented here as a block. Um, so that's one module. That's another. That's another, and so on. And all the way from level three to level six, even level seven, were were involved. I'll, I'll talk about that later. So you can see that they have uh, each. This is three days before the exam. This is two days before the exam. This is one day. So mostly they are there one day before the exam. This is remember the first time we are using it in in across the multiple modules, and the students haven't used this before, so they are unfamiliar with this, and they they've been launched the, the service one or two weeks before the exam because I've said to the model coordinator maybe they, that's when they're going to be most likely using it, but. In the future years, this pattern kind of has changed, not just stuck near the exam. But anyways, so the students who are much ahead in their in their course, they are uh, reaching a much larger number of uh, engagement. You know, 90 percent in some cases, 89, 86. Whereas in the foundation where I think we needed it to be working from day one the most, only about half the population is, is kind of using it. 
uh, in the first year of the of the of the pilot, but later on it the it increases. Um, so then this is just sort of showing uh, some average scores of different groups of people, people with high attendance, people with the uh, you know high with use of examopedia, people with no use of not not using examopedia. These are some differences there, but they are not quite conclusive. They are obviously in favor a little bit of examopedia being used, but they're not statistically, I would say, or one grade difference uh, in some cases they are, but not always. Um, so I'm not going to say that this is an evidence for, but I'm saying that there are there are benefits to, uh, to, 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 to students even who are high attendance um, attending in the class. They, if, you, you, if they are using Examopedia, they tend to have a better average than compared to um, other scenarios when they don't, but not a huge difference each time. So a, a greater number of cases will be needed to, to prove um, any sort of significant effects. And now this then uh, compared to attendance in the last uh, revision session, um, this is another way of looking at it as to how many people actually were there in the classrooms versus how many people were there on the document using it, reading it or contributing on it put together. So that's, that's the comparison. And only in one instance here, this is about the same. And I think Jeb uh, showed some data as well, which it was the other way around, maybe in, maybe in a couple of places. Uh, so I didn't capture that one here because I Jen already had that. Um, and then in terms of uh, averages uh, on, on modules uh, where Examopedia was used versus what not used, this is not like a controlled experiment, but we just said sort of some people used it, some didn't use it. Uh, and we then looked at there because we could track on Google Docs um, who are using Examopedia and who are not. So therefore, we then look at their marks and see the averages. So clearly, again, one module which is below uh, others, and this was a particularly bad module where the person uh, we had a staff member leave. So you know it's below pass mark even. So it's a very difficult year for the for those students. Um, and I ended up doing half of the examopedia for half of the module, and um, yeah, it kind of is is um, same. But anyways, um, you can see in the other cases it's mostly more average than otherwise in terms of student comments i did a thematic analysis of all these um, survey data and, and other data that i could collect from module surveys end of module surveys um, so the first one here is about academic workload and the students recognizing the effort that the staff has made in this case it's jeb's uh, student uh, they are really appreciating his input and saying uh, it would have been not been easy to give individual feedback to a class of 120. This is his one of the bigger class. Okay, and the 120 is a student number. I don't think it's a um, actual class size, but he's hinting that it's a big, big class. Um, students start to see it when you're using it in this way in that exam revision period. They start to see and they want it to then come further up in, in the teaching weeks as well as a directed study opportunity or assessment for learning uh, opportunity. So Examopedia came towards the end of the course. Assuming it came earlier, it would be nice. Da, da, da. That's you, you get the point there. Um, also, it, some of these comments kind of align to this access to social and cultural capital of the class, which is quite unique, uh, you know, from coming from students saying uh, collective information of the class gives various views. We've seen that one before. Example is actually a helpful tool where we can see each other's opinions and answers on the particular question or topic. It is also a helpful tool because it gives you gives out or posts the question that we would not have expect in the exam. So we're giving them all sorts of questions so that they are very much prepared going in to the exam with less anxiety than than before, so that we can learn from this from start and and so on. Right? Okay. And then last one is about benefits for self-efficacy um, motivating motivation as well as lowering some anxieties in the students example it helped me so much to prepare for the exams it gave me the chance to study more on my own and boosted my confidence there we go so confidence and uh, self-efficacy and lowering um, anxiety they are related 
Now we come to the uh, much awaited, I guess, uh, part of it. We're talking about open book as, an, as a disruptor as well as the, the chat GPT solutions uh, that we are uh, talking about today. Um, so it, during the pandemic, what did we learn? We, we, we moved from closed book exam to completely take at home open book exams where they would have full access to everything. And that kind of changed a lot for us. We thought that's already you know, moving from assessment of learning to assessment for learning, purely because the questions that we would be needing in the, in the exam would no longer be recalled, no longer be root learning type questions. It will have some application orientation. And I, I released a, uh, a document, I'll, I'll share it with you, the link, and that was to how to design questions for, for open book examination. And this document had been downloaded in excess of 1,000 uh, number of times, uh, at least from my records, but also from Sally Brown, who used it. And then she circulated it. It, it was about 3,000 or so downloads in her document. So uh, good guidance there for how to design an open book exam for the pandemic period. That's when I released it. Um, but also benefits for people with disability. And uh, as it is, open book has a, a research um, evidence that it, it reduces about 17 18 percent less anxious people because they can come in with their books and they can you know, write from the book if they if, if recall is the question but that's we don't use recall as as a style of question in an open book exam but still it students have its effect of reducing um, open book has the effect of reducing anxiety in students now we'll come to the negative side of, of open book exams academic integrity uh, issue you know who's doing the exam is it been done by the student or has been um, outsourced to some some website or is it chat gpt and so on uh, and the reducing anxiety as i was hinting earlier there has a downside is because uh, the students come in uh, too relaxed and sometimes they are then shocked by the type of exam question that they see and therefore using examopedia for training students for this format of exam is also a use case you know and we've been doing that the other thing, um, so now I'm just going to sort of do a question, I guess, I can ask you if you can post in the chat, are you back to the traditional exam or are you still using open book exams, but invigilating them and not giving access to the internet like we are? That's what we are doing here in, in, in Portsmouth. We don't give access to the internet, but students can bring in handwritten notes, books, whatever they want to bring in, and the exam is designed in a very different way with the staircasing as well as um, you know, uh, application oriented uh, questions. And what what now with the with the uh, chat GPT around? I mean, it, 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 can you still continue doing take at home exams? Uh, do you feel that's uh, that's okay? Or, 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 or do you think that there is uh, some potential maybe benefits of, of this kind of new technology? Uh, and we've thought about it and we are, as it was hinted earlier in, in both of our parts, that we are using Examopedia or Examopedia style document alongside these uh, language models, large language models, to tap in not just the social and cultural capital of the class, but also of this tool. This tool is capable of talking back with some useful, sometimes not so useful comments and really, very really, that sits very nicely with Examopedia because that's what we are doing. You know, in Examopedia, some answers are very good, some are not very good. We have access to the social and cultural capital of the class, but we can then as academics come in, iron out any, any difficulties that the students are having to understand that topic. But another uh, thing that can happen if we if we use this tool alongside is it could trigger independent learning and that's kind of already happening. Um, one way that I've, I've used the uh, in the chat GPT is to basically have student after the students have given their answer, I stick an answer from chat GPT and ask them to criticize it. And it's sometimes it's so good the answer, even though it is wrong, it is so confidently written that the students wouldn't find it to be any, you know, it wouldn't be uh, spotted by student. And only an expert eye would, would, would be needed to really critically um, uh, analyze that answer. Um, in, in the case of multipath communication, I teach telecommunications and it was beautifully written, but there was some very fundamental uh, error in the, in, in the answer, which, which completely destroys the understanding. It's not correct whatsoever. So, it gives the chance for students to criticize and if they didn't you could then 
highlight that you know the, the tool is not always right you you can't really trust it it is it, it is still learning and it will probably get better in the in the long run but it's not always correct at the minute an alternative approach i used was to ask chat gp to say not make the answer very good could you make it a less uh, polished answer and in that it sticks in some mistakes and fantastic then then i can get the students now say i've i've used examopedia with your answers now chat gpt is a one of our um, you know fellow members of the class if you like now can you give it some negative feedback or critical feedback and that's a useful exercise to to, to go through and that's you know students can practice the skills which they will be needing in a world where we are surrounded by ai tools and we are having to rely on ai based decisions um, if the students are able to criticize things uh, right now that's a valid skill to to develop and and make use of later on in their lives and one more way is to ask uh, you know the students to find out um sorry not the students um yeah actually sorry ask the students to use chat, chat gpd if they have access to it and tell uh, get it to tell you the threshold concepts of the of the subject that you are that you are dealing with and in doing that that has uh, you know okay it comes up with some answer uh, but then you can ask the it to to elaborate on it further and that way the student can go on on a, on a journey uh, and of learning and making sure that learning is correct we're asking them to share that information back on a, on a google document just like example style document and that seems to be working well as well because i've asked people to write some code i've asked people to write some uh, answers theoretical answers and so on and that's been coming back um, to to us via the, via the documents yet another way is to ask chat gpt to list cognitive conflicts it's quite uh, good I've, I've tried it myself uh, in that sense it, it highlights mistakes that people have made in the past in my own exams in my own coursework uh, and I asked it to make that prediction of what cognitive conflicts will students uh, face in this topic. And it's presented more than what I knew to, to start off. Um, and again, they may not be all correct, but they are, I can, I can verify them. And if it, if it makes sense to me, I can then use it in Examopedia and I post it and say, okay, well, there you go, which one is right? And that's the kind of thing I'm anyways hoping for Examopedia to present more to students because if students have two very strong views and they are conflicting, uh, only one of them is right. Um, it's important to get the wrong one corrected in the in the in, in the student's head before uh, you know for for learning to really last. Uh, I'm conscious of time, but this is this is another way that we are looking into. Well, I'm I'm not really gonna. Uh, yeah, take any more of your time have, have a read of this but if you feel that there is some uh, synergies between your and our ideas and if you'd like to take part in some collaborative work you are more than welcome to reach out to us and if you have any questions uh, now please feel free to ask uh, in the chat or, or with the microphone Okay, so there are some, uh, I'll take the questions maybe in the chat first. Uh, Jeb, if you wanna chip in, please do. We have a mix, most are back to back, uh, sorry, most are back to close book. A few are open, so you are responding to my previous comment. You have one exam that's in a PC cluster. Okay, but Manish, I can actually um, perhaps give an answer to this question. Um, uh, Sakiro has asked, how do we make students to respond to the questions as they might see it as an additional form of assessment, which they might consider too much? Also, it says that staff might consider it as additional workload. Um, if I start from the second part, um, the way we did initially, um, the only thing I did, I prepared some questions, um, which is not too difficult. You don't need to have the solutions because um, when we are preparing exam questions, you need to have the solutions ready. You need to have standard questions, staircasing, etc. But in this case, you have a little bit of freedom. So you prepare just some questions. And we had someone from our IT department who put them together in a tabulated form and put it on uh, our virtual learning platform. So it was not really too much work. And then uh, for the checking, then it's not really um, too much. As I said, the students only a few days to the exam contribute i mean the majority of the students will contribute a few days to the exam so you will just check and provide some comments because you know the answer so um it, it 
shouldn't be um shouldn't take that much time um of course now uh, this year for example i did it myself i uh, put it in a, in the of course we had a template so i put the questions uh, in the same template and put it up on uh, the platform and uh, the students could just and just sharing with the student or making making it available to the students um, the first part, students um, see it as an additional form of assessment. It is not mandatory for everyone to contribute eventually. So um, there is no, they don't need to have, uh, you know, to pressurize or to have a, a anxiety to, to doing things there. They, they, and once a few students start contributing, which could be perhaps good students at the beginning, then later on the students will find it easier to come and contribute and put their answers. Um, so it is not really I, I haven't seen any objection to using this this, uh, this source for the students yes thank you jeb i think it's it's right that neither have i the students are either um happily contributing to it or happily reading so the reach kind of shows you that and once within let's say engineering and if you've got a question you, you have a certain way to solve it there'll only be three, four, five ways of, of solving it, maybe making some mistakes or not make it, you know. So once you have seen four or five answers anyways, it's kind of job done for that question. So there's no pressure on every single student to contribute, but different students can contribute on different questions. That way we can split the load as well. But because it's one document, it doesn't make any difference. Uh, it doesn't have to be taken by every student. Okay. So Tristan is making a, a question here as well. Would it be possible to use Examopedia style with non-subject specialist staff learning support? So we have tried in the past uh, to bring in uh, academic support tutors um, who are actually, they are subject specialists. Uh, they, they understand the subject. Um, but um, with regards um, learning support, providing feedback moderation, uh, I don't see why not, because it, but that would be a more of a personal uh, support, isn't it? Learning support. So maybe, maybe not. You can you can try. I think it's a depends on the the need of the student there. Uh, if it's about academic writing, perhaps that could be a general document where learning support staff could um, could provide the feedback, uh, and that would be useful to more than one student, perhaps. I don't know. What do you think, Tristan? Uh, yeah, yeah, that sounds roughly what I was thinking. Okay, um, thank yeah. you. So, so yeah, non-teaching staff can yeah. can get involved. But yeah, thank you. Thank you, thank you. So Kwan has asked if it's, is it really for exam uh, um, essay type questions? No, with Chat GPT, yes, perhaps for now. But but as as Jeb has shown in his uh, slides, Jeb, if you maybe I can show you some slides as well. Um, uh, in, in in that you can write equations and solve questions uh, with the proper derivation in a step by step. All of that is possible. You can do that by hand and take a picture of your um, and then stick it in the document or or you could use the equation editor to write equations. So it's not necessarily only for essay uh, format exams, but it is it, it, that that is one way of where it is also used and uh, it can help clarify um, con cognitive conflicts that, that might be there in a particular topic that you're teaching. Does that answer your question, Kwan? Great, thank you. Okay, so I've put a link for uh, the feedback for today's session. If there are any more questions, please keep them coming. But if there's, uh, if that's it, then that's it. And please complete uh, the, the feedback. Uh, thank you for for coming along, and uh, and thank you for all your questions and contributions. Thank you. I'm going to stop the recording now. For coming.